Good morning. We're going to get started. If you can grab a seat, please. My name is Kathy Boger, and I'm an adoption coach and founder of Embracing Adoption. And more importantly, I'm a disciple, so will you join me as we pray? Father, thank you so much that you've given us your heart for the fatherless. God, that is your heart, and God, we want to imitate that. Thank you so much for caring those who can't, for those who can't speak for themselves. God, and I want to lift up every single child represented here by an adult, a caregiver, a parent, or even someone that wants to help an adoptive or foster family. Those joining us virtually and those who will be listening to the recording, God, you know all of them by name. You know everything that ever happened to them. God, and I just lift them up to you, that you would work through this class and everything that the parents do and with your mighty hand to heal them. God, thank you for this time. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, my journey with adoption started when I was seven years old, when my parents adopted my brother. So here's a picture of us in 1972. I'm kind of dating myself a little bit. Um, the older one of the two brothers is a biological sibling. And then Tom the Blonde was adopted when he was just three days old. My parents, uh, my mom gave birth to the two of us, uh, but had varicose veins pretty badly. And so the doctor said she should not have any more children, but they always wanted three. So they adopted Tom. And then fast forward many years, um, married my wonderful husband Lee, who's here, and had our oldest, Natalie, in that picture there from 1999. Then had two miscarriages which was difficult, um, and we thought maybe, maybe God didn't want us to have more children, and that's when I started watching those programs, you know, those 60-minute programs of the Russian orphanages that are deplorable and horrible, and was crying through those um, and wanted to adopt very strongly. Of course, I grew up in the family with adoption, so it was all very natural to me, it made sense. Um, however, it didn't make sense to Lee at the time, uh, fortunately, God um, gave us Mariah, our youngest, and I was still praying about adoption, but it wasn't as much on my heart um, and, until Lee just said, I, I kept kind of giving him the elbow every time something was said from the pulpit about adoption or something, and he said, he finally said, Kathy, stop nagging me, and he was right. So I stopped, and I prayed every day because it kept growing in my heart <laughs> to adopt a child, and uh, Hannah was my hero, Hannah in the Bible. And three years later, one day, Lee says, well, if we're going to adopt, let's just do it. And I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> I'll get on the paperwork right away. And so there you see David. Um, he was four years old when we adopted him from Romania. And so this photo was taken just shortly after that. Yes, we did adopt out of birth order. Um, and he just is a joy. Uh, have we had our challenges? Yes, which I'll tell you more about later. Um, but that's a little bit about us, and here we are, fast forward. Um, recently, our daughter, our oldest daughter, Natalie's wedding. So you'll see Riot is in the maroon there. And then our new son-in-law next to Natalie, the bride, Sorenzo, and on the other side of me is uh, our son, David. He's now 27 years old. You know, as a parent, I still am in the battle with you. And we have been in the battle for over 20 years. And I applaud you for your hearts, your efforts in parenting. <laughs> you're here, you're joining this workshop at nine in the morning when you've been two days or three days or the whole week here of conferences. And it's a heavy topic, I can't change that. But we are gonna have a little break to kind of lighten things up in the middle of it. And I wanna thank everybody virtually for joining as well. Hopefully by the end of this time, you'll have a little bit, a few more tools in your tool, your parenting tool belt, especially how it has to do with um, childhood trauma. And I'm gonna go ahead and, um, oh, also I have a copy of the notes um, up front. You can get those afterwards. The first page is on the app, the co conference app. The second page is an ACEs um, questionnaire, which we'll talk about in, in a minute. I'm sure some of you are familiar with ACEs. And then the last page is a resource page. It has a lot in there, including 
I want to mention um, an adoption conference and fostering conference in October that you can attend virtually as well from anywhere. All right. So our objectives today, first is to understand childhood trauma. I know you probably already understand it, but we're going to go a little bit deeper maybe um, as to what causes it and somehow the brain works. Then secondly, we're going to talk about our response as parents. And then thirdly, their need, the children's need. But before we define childhood trauma, let's talk about a couple myths. First one, children don't remember anything before the age of three. Myth. They probably don't remember as much, obviously, but uh, we do know that their bodies remember. Another myth, children are resilient and they can handle it. Yes, children can be resilient, but it usually takes a solid relationship with an adult that they can trust to get that resilience. Let's define trauma. Okay, this is textbook. This is what the, the people studying, you know, the, getting their match, masters in social work is from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Individual trauma results from an event series of events, set of circumstances experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening and having last, lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. Wow. That's a lot, but I think that really describes it well. Our kids come to us from hard places. I have worked with children, uh, families I've coached, where the children have been homeless, where they have seen domestic violence. Um, I forgot to mention that I'm also a CASA, and I, you know, the CASA girl I have now, she's 14 years old, and she witnessed her father trying to kill her stepmother. So I've seen a lot of those, and you know, we don't know, a lot of us, what they've experienced before they come to our home. We have really very little information on David from his first four years. We do know he was abandoned at 18 months old uh, for poverty reasons is all we know. But they can also experience things after they come into our home, right? Um, for instance, our son experienced bullying at school. That's not as severe as a trauma, but things happen that we can't control. Even though trauma stems from a disturbing experience, not all these experiences produce trauma for children. It really depends on the child. It'll be based on their age, both chronologically and developmentally. And it's important to understand the seriousness of the effect of trauma on a child's health, both physically and emotionally. Trauma can start in utero, and I don't mean just drug and alcohol abuse. Trauma can start in utero from the mother's experiences of extreme stress during pregnancy. That can be passed on in utero to the child. Things like domestic violence, mental illness, poverty, housing instability. And I encourage you to take a deeper look at how trauma changes the brain. Um, it would, we could literally have a two-day seminar on that. And there are seminars out there if you're interested. Um, a lot of reading you can do for sure. The body stores those events that are traumatic. We all experience traumatic events, right? Probably the older we are, the more we've experienced just by the sheer being on this earth. Try to imagine all that you've experienced, all the trauma that you've experienced, and put it in four years, the first four years of a child's life. That's incredible for a four-year-old to have to process that that much trauma. You know, that gets rewired in our brains when something happens. For instance, I heard a story the other day of a lady driving, started to snow, the roads got slick. She witnessed a fatal car accident. Obviously, that was disturbing to her. Fast forward, the next time she's out and it starts to snow, what do you think happens? Her heart races, she panics. All of a sudden, she's reliving that. We can't help that. That's in the brain. That's what happens. There's a lot we can do to heal that. In fact, this class 
called Navigating Childhood Trauma. The class was going to be entitled Overcoming Childhood Trauma. That's the title they gave me. And I said, can we please change it? Because this side of heaven, I don't know if we're going to overcome childhood trauma. But we can navigate it, and there is healing that comes. Now we're going to watch a short video that explains the findings of the ACEs study. And like I said, you may know about that, but in case you don't, um, I think this is just kind of a good video that describes it. So let's take a look. What does your parents' divorce have to do with your risk for heart disease? If your mother had a drinking problem when you were growing up, are you more likely to suffer from depression as an adult? Here's what you should know about ACEs. ACEs stand for Adverse Childhood Experiences, extremely stressful events that can happen to a child growing up. Some experiences are so stressful that they can alter brain development as well as the immune system increasing the risk of lifelong health and social problems in adulthood. The term comes from the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, landmark research that shed new light on the root cause of everything from stroke and liver disease to substance abuse and mental illness. In the late 1990s, an epidemiologist from the Centers for Disease Control and a preventive medicine doctor at Kaiser Permanente set out to understand the association between childhood experience and lifelong health. They asked over 17,000 people in the Kaiser Health Plan in San Diego about their health history, as well as difficult questions about their experiences growing up. different kinds of adversity in this largely middle class and college educated population. They were stunned to see how common ACEs were. 21% of all respondents were sexually abused as children. 19% grew up with someone who suffered mental illness. 28% had been physically abused. And two out of three respondents had experienced at least one ACE. The researchers next looked at how someone's ACE score, or the number of adversities they experienced, related to a wide array of serious health and social problems. They saw that the more ACEs someone had, the greater their risk for poor outcomes compared with someone with no ACEs. Someone with an ACE score of four had twice the risk of heart disease and cancer. Someone with an ACE score of five had an eight times greater chance of being an alcoholic. And those with an ACE score of six or more, on average, died 20 years earlier. With every major problem they looked at in the ACE study, the risk went up for each additional adverse experience in childhood. As Dr. Robert Anda says, what's predictable is preventable. It's important to remember that ACEs are not destiny. ACEs are a tool for understanding the health of a population as a whole. For individuals, an ACE score can be a tool for understanding their own risk for health and social problems and empower them to make changes for themselves and their children. ACEs tend to get passed down from generation to generation and are common across all income levels, races, and cultures. But increasingly, people of all different professions and backgrounds are coming together to discuss how ACEs affect their communities. They're finding new ways to treat and prevent ACEs. 
Many doctors are starting to screen their patients for ACEs as part of their medical history. More schools are becoming trauma-informed, considering the source of problem behavior when disciplining their students instead of immediately suspending or expelling them. To learn more about interrupting the cycle of adversity and improving health and well-being for the next generation, please visit kpjrfilms.co. So that's pretty heavy, especially if you haven't seen that before. And like they said, it's not their destiny. It just helps us to know where they've come from. So it's research, right? It is what it is. Now what do we do with it as parents? First of all, I'd recommend that you fill, if you haven't already, to fill out a, one of those ACEs questionnaires for each of your adopted or foster children. It gives you kind of a pulse for their ground zero. Not to discourage you, like I said, I know that you're here and you want your children and you want to provide that loving and safe home which you're doing. For David, when I did this, we, Lee and I didn't even know about this until after he graduated high school. In fact, probably 95% of what I'm sharing, uh, we didn't know about when we were raising David. I, I sure wish we did. But I'm glad that the resources are there for you. Um, I had to guess with his questionnaire because I didn't know a lot of background. At my best guess, his score was a five out of 10. And I just started weeping. <laughs> I just thought he's got so many knocks against him already. And now I would just thought he's, he's just doomed. I was, I was feeling hopeless. I was like, great, he's gonna die 20 years early. He's gonna have heart disease. I just felt hopeless. My husband, however, when he learn about ACEs responded in a much more spiritual way, <laughs> um, it really helped him to be less frustrated when our son had behaviors. And yes, even after age 18, there are behaviors, <laughs> um, at least in our son's case. Um, you know, even Jesus in Matthew 9 looks at people as helpless and harassed. That helps me when I think of our son as helpless and harassed. But it really helped us both to realize that he came to us at four years old more broken and hurt than we thought. And we just don't know how much of that stems back to the trauma. A secure attachment with an adult goes very far in healing wounds from early childhood trauma. Feel great about that. Like I said, you're here, which means you wanna learn about these tools to lessen the impact of trauma on your children and help heal. I just wanna encourage you that the moment your child came, that child came into your home, the trajectory of their life just got better. <laughs> and God's at work, obviously, in your children's life. I'd like to use our son as an example about just the trauma he faced in the first couple weeks. And everything I'm sharing with you has been, he's given me permission to share. Uh, first two weeks, we got on the plane from Romania. He didn't speak a lick of English. <laughs> I knew um poco in Romanian. <laughs> so, um, you know, he was the first thing he was separated from his caregivers, never to be seen again. Um, a new language he was surrounded with that he didn't understand. And it's heartbreaking to think he didn't even know how to communicate things. Here's a four year old, he couldn't even tell us when he was hungry or sad or scared. It just breaks my heart, he couldn't even tell us. Um, new sounds, new smells, experiences, a new home. He had no idea how long he'd be there. He had been bounced around and he, we couldn't tell him you're gonna be here forever. You know, he didn't know that. Even on the flight home, I think we saw trauma. We didn't even know that much about it, like I said, but you know, you've got that long part of the flight, eight hours over the ocean and you know, the flight attendant says, roam about the cabin, you know, and then when you get ready to land, you've gotta put that seatbelt on. He would have nothing of it. But of course we had to, get the seatbelt on. And when we did, he straightened out his legs on the chair in front of him and pushed, and I saw adult-like anger in a four-year-old. I'd never seen anything like that in a child. And I thought, dear Lord, what have they done to him? Had they restrained him in the orphanage? I don't know. We saw a couple other things like that in his life, but really apart from that, there wasn't a lot of signs of childhood trauma. 
His history was mostly unknown. He did struggle with lying more than most kids that we knew. Um, then in middle school, he started being bullied. So that added to everything. Um, he often had anger outbursts, which lessened after we switched him off the ADHD medication to a natural supplement. I forgot to mention he was diagnosed with severe ADHD and central auditory processing disorder. And based on his facial features and things in his life since then, I'm pretty sure he has fetal alcohol syndrome as well. So the lack of uh, remorse and the lying continued, um, as did the inappropriate behavior to get laughs from kids at school. And then one day when he was 15 years old, he ran away from home. That was really scary. And I know that happens, and I'm sorry if that's happened in your house. Um, fortunately, he came back before it was, had been 24 hours. It was about 4.30 in the morning. I was laying on the couch waiting for him. Um, but it was then that Lee and I just thought, wow, there, there's some real broken. This is really serious. Um, then it was then, uh, I was going to say, we uh, didn't have the resources we have like we have today. You know, conferences like this. I mean, praise God for this. Isn't this great? We have this morning and more classes to come. And so, I mean, this is great. But we didn't have that. Uh, we didn't have, parent, you know, su adoption support groups. You know, there's specific parenting methods out there for kids from trauma background. We didn't have any of that. But we did take him at age 16 to a Christian counselor who himself was adopted, and that helped a great deal. Psalm 147.3 reads, he heals the brokenhearted and binds their wounds. In Psalm 34, 18, similar, it says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. God is not unaware. He saw every experience that our child had. We're going to move on and look at some of the signs of childhood trauma. You can see them here. Um, the ones I've circled are specific to um, a child in a family I've worked with, although a lot of these our son has experienced as well. So here's age three. This particular child was emotionally overwhelmed, had self-destructive behaviors, hypervigilant, and irritable. This is 11 years old. We've got more things circled. Interestingly enough, the self-destructive behaviors that this child had at three are not there. But we've got more things circled. And then here's 18 years old, even more. The self-destructive behaviors are back. Now we've got substance abuse, shame, self-hatred. You know, what I'm going to share today will not take all these away. There's no way. But if we put these things into practice to help healing, help the healing, there will be fewer of these. That's what we want and with God's involvement in their lives. So now we're going to take a look at another video, just one minute this time. It's a shorter version. Um, it's a clip of a longer video that I put the, on the notes the link to called Removed. And it's a dramatization of a little girl who ended up in foster care. And it shows what happened in her past and a traumatic response, a behavior in the future that's related to that. So let's take a look.
and that's really disturbing. I really applaud the foster mom. She didn't respond or react. And that's the hard part, but that's what we've got to do, is to stop and think about the behavior and what's behind it. Now, she didn't know what we got to see, what happened before. She didn't know that. But obviously, in our homes, I would imagine if a child says to her mom, I hate you, and throws something, there would be some consequences, as there should be. That doesn't change when the children come from trauma backgrounds. What I'd like to present to you is what changes is how you deal with it. Taking extra time, talking more if the child's old enough, seeing if there's needs that aren't met, and then maybe dealing with it in a different way. And I want to also say that those signs of childhood trauma that we had up on the screen, if your children have that, that doesn't necessarily mean they have childhood trauma if they have those signs. But definitely, if you see more than one of those it's, and you haven't talked with a professional about it, I definitely would recommend doing that. You know, it's easier to accept that behavior when you do take the time. Like, wasn't it easier to understand it when we saw what happened to the little girl? And rather than getting frustrated, which I know is my tendency, stop and take that time. And ask the child if they're old enough. Why are you feeling this? Are you thinking about something? Are you remembering something? And to find out. So there are many examples of trauma in the Bible. Uh, you know, from... Eve, think about Eve, not childhood trauma, but Adam and Eve. Can you imagine having two children and one murders the other? I mean, just the trauma. I mean, you know, there's so many things. You've got Job. You've got Hagar, who was sent out, and then her son did experience that trauma. Isaac, I mean, you know, your dad having a knife at you. You know, just there's so many different things. But let's do a case study on Moses. We know he was adopted. His mother, Jacobed, um, wanted to spare his life when Pharaoh was killing all the Hebrew babies, baby boys, put him in that basket. Now, I've always thought of it kind of growing up. I learned about this, right? And I just thought, oh, he just floated down, and just a minute later, <laughs> you know, Pharaoh's daughter picked him up. Well, I did a little research, and in the Nile River, there are alligators. <laughs> and if they're alligators today, I'm guessing there were alligators back then. And so we, we really don't know what Noah's, um, sorry, Moses' little body experienced. Then he went back with his mom to be nursed for a couple years, so he probably picked up on the language and, and the culture a little bit, at least. Now back into the Egyptian home, he was raised in a different culture, right? Um, probably a different language. The family might have even had a different skin color, and we just don't know what kind of comfort or healing he got from his parents, you know, from that Pharaoh's daughter. We definitely know she probably wasn't trauma-informed, right, <laughs> back then. So um, let's just speculate what this could have done to Moses as an adult. I'm just speculating. He killed an Egyptian. We know that. In Exodus 3.11, he says, who am I? He was insecure about leading his people. So who am I? That's an identity thing. Doesn't that happen with our kids, depending on the situation? He lost his temper with the Israelites, struck the rock instead of speaking to it. You know, we don't know. But my guess is there was something deep down in there that might have been behind this. But you know what's great is God used him in a powerful way. God saw beyond his trauma. You know, he chose Moses out of one, one of three human beings of all time to appear at the transfiguration to encourage Jesus. I'm like, wow. And I want to give you that hope for your children. Trauma does not define your child. Okay, now we're going to take a little break, like I promised. Um, and in a minute, what we're going to do, just for fun, <clears throat> and also for that connection. At the conference, this is just a great place to connect. You're in person. The people in this room get you, right? I'm sure you've talked with a lot of disciples in your church who are well-meaning brothers and sisters. 
but you know, they just don't get it, right? But we do, we're in this room, you know, I think we get this. So in a minute, I'm gonna have everybody stand up and I'm gonna ask some questions about subsets of you who are here and you can raise your hand. And I want to, would like for you to look around and see who else is raising their hand at that question and pick one person, we're gonna have a few minutes, to go and meet and exchange phone numbers with that's in your same subgroup. Now, you won't have time to tell your whole story, but that's what we're gonna do. So everybody stand up, please. Also, while we're doing that, I'm gonna put my phone number on the screen. This is for mostly the virtual audience for your questions. We're gonna have Q&A at the end, so because you're not here, we'd love to hear, hear your questions, so please text them to my number. I hope you made some great connections. <coughs> I'll be reading from Philippians 4, verse 19. <clears throat> it says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Amen. All of your needs as parents, and I believe in time all of your children's needs. So what is our response? We've talked about trauma. Let's move on to what is our response as parents. It begins with a faith and dream of who our children can become with God's help. We are conduits. God does the work. You all have compassion or you would not have fostered or adopted. And I hope I haven't scared any of you away who are considering it. <laughs> um, not all situations are like this. Okay, these are the hardest situations I'm talking about. My parents actually saw no trauma in my brother Tom. Um, in fact, my mom always tells people that he was the most well-behaved child of the three of us, and she would be right. <laughs> he was. Um, you know, you have that James 127 heart. It talks about the pure and faultless religion because you are looking after the orphans of our day. Yes. <laughs> At moments of that extreme behavior, we need to remember their rocky start in life. I know this is hard. This doesn't happen like you just go, oh, every time they're having a behavior, I'm remembering. But that's the goal, just to keep bringing yourself back to that. Helps us not to be frustrated. Remember that, helpless and harassed. The coping and regulation skills don't come naturally to them. They don't come naturally to any children, but especially these kids. And we as parents can learn to be more patient with them. They will react to our reactions. This is so important. If I get triggered and frustrated and let it show, my child's gonna either mirror that or it's gonna affect them in some way. And everything I'm saying, a lot of this applies to all children, but so much more. Like some of the things I'm gonna say, you've heard at parenting workshops, but just so much more with these children. If I raise my voice and scrunch up my eyebrows, it means something to these kids. It really hurts them. Just even doing that, they could go back to a memory. Just that. So if you're the one who's likely to get triggered, we're all different, then ask your spouse to step in. Or if you're a single parent, take a time out, go pray. Have your kids pray with you if they're old enough. And just being humble with God to ask for that help, even before your children praying, God, please help mommy to be more patient today. <laughs> Trauma is stored in the midbrain, and it takes pieces of evidence and makes them frozen in time and space. If we remember something negative, like the woman driving in the snow who saw the fatal accident, we're going to keep recalling those things because it strengthens the synaptic connections, unfortunately. The more the brain recalls a traumatic experience, the more the brain can stay in that triggered state. So when your child is bouncing off the wall or screaming or something or hibernating in their room, this could be going on. They are more triggered e more easily than children without that trauma background. The healing begins with us, right? We know that as the primary caregivers, these are the things that researchers say are the most important. Connection, trust, consistency, and time. And like I said, these are nothing new. We've heard these at parenting workshops. But trust heals trauma. 
Our children were harmed through relationships, so they're going to be healed through relationships, right? There's no magic response or formula for our response. But how do you connect with your child? That's different for everybody. You already know some ways that you connect. But I want to say never underestimate the power of having fun with them, especially these kids. (laughs) They did an overabundance of fun. They need to see you laugh. I mean, belly laugh, really laugh. (laughs) According to Dr. Daniel Hughes, eye contact, voice tone, touch, movement, and gestures are actively employed to communicate safety, acceptance, curiosity, playfulness, and empathy, and never threat or coercion. These interactions are reciprocal, not coerced. And please remember, connection before correction. Very important. Trust. Obviously, be true to your word, follow through. One way I have seen that trust can be destroyed is to talk on the phone with a friend about something negative about your child when they're in earshot. I've seen this so many times. Even those three-year-olds, I tell you, they're picking up things. And a child could be in the other room. Or you think they're sleeping. So please, please be very careful. That destroys trust. And as kids get older, what we did with our kids when they got older, we explained to all of them, hey, mommy and daddy need help with being the best mom and dad we can be to you. So we are going to talk with a couple friends in church that we trust that'll give us advice and help us with this. So there may be times when we're sharing some of what you have gone through to get help, but that's why. That helped, I think, for us to explain that to your children. What we, I think I could have done a much better job at, I know I could have, is to be more selective in who I shared those things with. It seems like, you know, the moms get together and they're like, oh, my Johnny did this. Yeah, he, you know. we. That just destroys trust with your kids. So my recommendation would be pick one or two close friends at church that get you, that understand your family situation as much as possible, and limit your sharing to those people. Other people don't need to know. It's, it's your child's story. We need to protect that as much as possible. And have your advice come through those couple people. So consistency, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. We're not going to really camp there. Uh, Time. I recommend one-on-one time with each child, with each parent. Monthly would be great, if not more. Now, I know that can be overwhelming. If you've got two children, that's one thing. If you've got five, that's entirely another. (laughs) So do what you can. Um, And like I said, it's, it's overwhelming to figure that out, but especially with the kids with the trauma background. Do whatever sacrifice. Make it special. For our son David um, and his time with with his dad, Lee, they would go out to the local Mexican restaurant, El Arrieros, and get the free chips and then an order of that white queso. So it was a cheap date, (laughs) and they got to talk. Sometimes it'll just be about nothing in particular. But David knew that he had those times he could count on, that he had Lee's ear. And things would come out during those times. He felt safe during those times. With boys, it's a little bit harder to get them to talk. Like maybe driving around in a car where you're both looking forward, you don't have to look at each other, (laughs) you know, or shooting hoops or something. You know, boys, it's a little bit more tricky to, to get them to talk. So I think that's really important. You know, your child's having you as a caring adult to go through life will help prevent future trauma from having as much of an impact. We can't prevent what's going to happen. But them knowing they have someone they can talk with. A lot of our children experience their first trauma with no one to talk with. That just makes it that much harder. And it just stays there that much more. So speaking of trauma, have you experienced secondary trauma from caring for your children? That's a real thing. Um, That trauma can come from the prolonged stress of dealing with these behaviors, which are an indirect result of the trauma. 
But let's look at a definition of secondary trauma. Post-traumatic symptoms experienced by those who are only indirectly exposed to trauma, whether by hearing stories about the event or by witnessing their negative effects on their loved one. So the stories come from the child to you, or you may experience that stress from just constantly dealing with the behaviors, constantly, constantly. Again, I don't want us to go into panic and go, great, you know, my kid has trauma, now I have trauma. You know, it's, <laughs> that's not the goal here, <laughs> to feel overwhelmed. But it's something to be aware of. You don't need to just jump there and go, I must have it. But, you know, give yourself grace, first of all, <laughs> and get the support you need. If you need to see a, a therapist or counselor or an adoption coach, please do that. One of the ways you can help yourself is self-care. That's a buzzword, right? I don't mean self-care um, as far as, you know, binging on two hours of Netflix or whatever. That's not the kind of self-care I'm talking about. I'm guessing that if you're in the thick of raising kids right now, you don't take enough time for yourself that you need. It's that Sabbath that the Bible talks about, right? We need that. So let's go through some specific ways. Time with the Lord. This goes without saying, we're disciples, but you know, it, when you have kids and they're up at six or something, that can easily be one of the last things. So please get back to that if you haven't. Bible study, prayer, being, just being close to God, having great times in prayer. And it might be short. Great can be short. <laughs> But, um, you know, whether it's setting your alarm before the kids get up or having some time after they go to bed. Time for yourself. And like I said, it's not the binging on Netflix we're talking about. We're talking about things that just help you to unplug, right? You might need to get creative. You might not be able to go out of the house and get a babysitter for this, but it may mean uh, reading a book at night after the kids go to bed, a book that you can enjoy and unwind with or a hobby or something do something that you need for your physical emotional and spiritual health please take time for those things every week would be great i know that doesn't always happen but please take time if you're married time with your spouse as a couple this may seem impossible too but where there's a will there's a way <laughs> You know, these children's issues take tolls on marriages. You don't want to turn around a couple years from now and just realize your marriage is in bad shape. So take the time now that you need. Uh, we had a babysitting co-op when the kids were growing up. It was great. <laughs> the kids called it kids' night. You know, we had three other families, and we took turns on a Saturday night staying home. It was also very good for other parents to really see our children and give us some good feedback. <laughs> that was good, too. But they had a great time. It was free. <laughs> It was really great. Um, you know, they really love stuff like that. Here's something to remember, too, that will help you with your just emotional well-being. Easier said than done, but don't take your child's difficulties personally. They went through this probably before they knew you. Sometimes things happen when they're in our care that we have no control over. But rather focus on the positive things. It's that Philippians 4, 8, right? Whatever's pure, lovely, lovely, righteous, think about those things. And I, what I do with my coaching clients is start off the session by talking about what has happened that's great. What changes have you seen? And sometimes, most times, the parents are just too busy to stop and look back and see how things have improved. So please take the time to do that. Next, outside support. We need that as well. Uh, you know, we didn't have a support group, like I said, but we did know of a couple who had adopted and they got calls from us. <laughs> we got help from them. Get help from an adoption coach or counselor, someone who specializes in adoption. Join a support group, start a support group. We didn't have a support group in our church, although there were lots of adoptive families. And I was talking with a sister years ago and said, well, why don't we have a support group? So the two of us started the support group, and it's great. I would say two-thirds of the time that we meet, we meet without the kids, and we have a topic each time that we talk about pertaining to adoption. It's also great for the people, uh, the parents who have the younger kids to be able to rub shoulders with the adoptive parents who have teenagers and, and kind of 
compare notes and get advice and get help that way. Um, that was really terrific. You know, also there's support groups online, not as good as in person, but um, if you're not, if you're on Facebook and not on the Forever Families page, please go look at that. That's an ICOC page just for us. Um, now there's not a lot of interaction as much as I'd like to see on there, so maybe we can just start that a little bit. Um, there's also other support groups on Facebook. I'm a part of three in addition to that one. I'm on one for parents of um, adults with fetal alcohol syndrome. I'm on one for adoptive and foster parents in my state of Indiana, and I'm also on another one for, um, what is the other one I'm on? <laughs> um, I'll think of it in a minute. <laughs> I said fetal alcohol syndrome, right? Indiana, I'll tell you when I think of it. <laughs> So anyway, what that does for me, um, like I said, it's not in person, but on those days, and we still go through things with our adult child, on those days when things are really hard, if I just go to, especially the fetal alcohol syndrome one, I'm like, wow, my problems are not near as bad, you know, and I can pray for these people too and understand a little bit more. Also, I'm really excited that I'd like to start today um, a virtual support group, which I'd like to invite you to. So um, I'll put my number up again if you'd like to be a part of that. I was thinking once a month and we'd pick a different topic. It would be just for ICOC members and it would be um, very confidential. And I also have the old fashioned clipboard up here. In fact, the notes are here for later and some other things if you'd like to pick up. But I'd like to do that because we need that. We definitely need that. You know, siblings can experience secondary trauma as well. Uh, siblings in the home. In fact, I have a coaching client who came to me initially because they wanted help with their um, biological children in regards to secondary trauma. They felt like their other kids had, their, their adopted kids had therapists and everything, but they were concerned about that. Last year I was asked to speak at a conference on this topic, secondary trauma from a sibling's perspective. So in preparing for that class, I asked our, our daughters, Nellie and Rye, uh, what they experienced growing up with David in the home. And they told me things I didn't know that I hadn't heard. And it was very sad. And so I wish I'd had more of those times like I was talking about to one-on-one -on -one times. And please ask specific questions like how, like if I had asked Natalie, how do you feel like it's going with you and David? I know he had this issue yesterday. How did that affect you? You know, and just really talking through those things. Of course, what's really interesting is both of our daughters have chosen compassion careers. <laughs> Natalie, nursing, and Rye works um, as a case manager and crisis responder for uh, families and children with mental health crises, and she's getting her master's in social work. So it's really interesting. <laughs> you know, I don't know what things would have been like if we never adopted our, our son, but I did watch them grow in their compassion yeah. through the years. I watched that. We couldn't help but grow as we navigated those challenges. And speaking of navigating challenges, let's move on to addressing our children's needs, specifically, as they have to do with childhood trauma. So if we can't help what happened to our children before they came to us, what can we do? Our job, along with the things we talked about, the connection, trust, is to offer support and healing. Resiliency happens when needs are met. Of course, there's no way to have that magic ball, right, and know if a certain behavior is tied to trauma like that video, but do study your children. This is what I recommend, studying your children. Stop and consider the why behind the behavior and why, when do those things happen? Do they happen when your child is hungry? Do they happen when you're rushing out the door? <laughs> you know, do they happen late at night? When do they happen? And so you can be more aware and in tune. For us, with David, uh, when he was in middle school, he would come home some days, not others, but some days, and he would just be kind of on edge. He would do what Lee and I called poking. It wasn't physical poking, but just kind of, I was the one that was home, Lee was at work, and he would just say things to get under my skin, and he knew exactly how to do that. <laughs> and the things he said, you know, and it was almost like a game that he was playing, and it wasn't anything he could put my finger on and really, you know, have a consequence for, but... It was very noticeable on some days and not others. That's what was just kind of tripping us up. You know, Leah and I were scratching our heads. So we prayed about it. We said, God, please help us know what is going on. And God answered that prayer. 
I don't remember exactly how it happened, but we connected that it was the days that he got bullied at school that he came home and was kind of attacking me on those days. Aha, now I get it, right? This is brilliant, I get it. And so um, I could sit down on those days and just have extra time with him and talk about his, what he experienced at school. In fact, I didn't even ask if he got bullied. I said, so what did they say today, you know, kind of thing. And it was great because, you know, with him, I, I learned things doing that. He actually believed that when somebody said something to him that it was an absolute truth. Like if someone said, you're ugly, that that meant he was ugly. And that came out of the conversation of just taking the time to sit down and talk. And then I could just encourage him, no, honey, <laughs> that, 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 just don't listen to them, you know, and, and just talk about what he was experiencing. So that was really helpful to know those things. Attachment happens when needs are met. Attachment is disrupted when needs are not met. Multiple caregivers over a short time kills attachment, if that's where your kids came from. Early attachment to caregivers develops, as we know, as the babies cry, and then they realize a human being is going to be there to meet their needs. In orphanages, babies are known to stop crying over time because they cry and nothing happens. Nobody responds, and they find, figure out that crying doesn't help. I personally believe there's a connection between the lack of attachment to an early caregiver and lying. This is just a Kathy Boger idea. But follow me here. So when they, there's not a close connection with a caregiver, you don't have that really closeness. You know, they're not gonna respond all the time to what the children need. If the closeness isn't there, then they're not gonna have the remorse if they do something to hurt that person. Just makes sense, like it'd be easier to lie to a complete stranger than it would be to my best friend. And so to me, that's, that just makes sense that that might be the case. Something to think about. So um, with David, I still try as an adult <laughs> to be cognizant of the fact that he could be um, going back to the temptation to feel like he might be abandoned someday, again. So like in middle school, when it was time to pick him up from swim team, whatever, I tried more, even more than I did with the girls to be sure I was on time. I didn't want him sitting there. All the other kids picked up, even if I was two or three minutes late, and him thinking, oh no, maybe she's abandoning me too. I don't know, he could go there. So that's what I think helps build that trust again, build the healing. I'm going to be here. Even now when he texts me or something, if I'm in the middle of a meeting, I try to text back and say, hey, I'm in a meeting. I can call you about 2 o'clock. You know? And with the girls, you know, they get it. We're all busy. You know? I don't get back to them for a few hours or maybe the next day. But with David, I really try to, to reinforce that I am not going anywhere. So let's talk about those some nuts and bolts practicals. And these are not, we're moving on from the healing of the trauma to how to deal with behaviors that come from the trauma. This is for moments when your child loses it and as things are getting out of control, right? <clears throat> like we discussed, you start with calming yourself, right? Now, how can you help your child? We're gonna start talking about regulation. And you probably know some of this, especially if you have a special needs child, you know a lot about this. Let's start with some basic definitions. Regulation is, for any of us, is what we feel on a good day, maybe our best day. And it's good to know what, what is regulation for your child? What does that look like? What's his body doing? Is he sitting calmly? Is he smiling? What does that look like for your child? A good day. Dis, and that's the baseline, right? Like their tone of voice, things like that. Dysregulation refers to a poor ability to manage emotional responses or to keep them within acceptable range of typical emotional reactions. This can refer to a wide range of emotions, including sadness, anger, irritability and frustration, too ramped up, even too quiet, unproductive, nervous, anxious, confused, silliness, 
Silliness is a cover-up for trauma. It is. Um, kids can go into that survival mode, greedy, avoidant, charming even, defiant, manipulative, hypervigilant, freezing, over-effective, affectionate, or reserved. Basically, anything above or below baseline. Usually it's above <laughs> baseline. Re-regulation, what does that mean? It means whatever it takes to get back to the baseline. Unless re-regulation happens, it's unlikely the child can do anything else, like homework, like listen to you when you're trying to correct them, like accept consequences. Like I said, connection before correction. We blew this too in raising our kids. We felt like if there was some issue, by golly, even if it's late at night and they're past their bedtime, we're gonna deal with it. And we're gonna get them to calm down and listen. But you know, especially for David, he, he that was worthless. That was useless. What he needed was get a good night's sleep and then we deal with the next day. If, you know, if they're old enough to make that connection. So, like I said, it's not the time to punish a, a child with trauma background or give ultimatums. That's not the time. They need to get calm first before you talk about things. Co-regulation is defined as warm and responsive interactions to provide the support, coaching, and modeling children need to understand, express, and modulate their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. How do we co-regulate a child? That basically it's kind of coming along with your child to help them get regulated. First of all, we need to calm ourselves, like I said before. Um, and then get at your child's level. Um, you know probably what it is already for your child. Every child's different. Use eye contact, humor, um, redirection, distraction. I saw a great example of this just recently. A sister in our church, she's not a parent, but she's an aunt, and she has her niece and nephew for a few weeks every summer. And the, the nephew is known in our church, and we know him, and he's got some issues, okay? And he gets very escalated very quickly. I saw this about to happen, or he was starting to get escalated, and then his aunt said, what's your birthday? I'm like thinking, what's your birthday? What does that have to do with anything? But then I got it. It was brilliant. So <laughs> she got him to stop thinking about what he was triggered about. He had to think about what his birthday was and tell her. And by that time, when he went back to whatever it was, he was less triggered. So I'm like, wow, well, I have to remember that. <laughs> that was great. Um, fidgets, weighted blankets, food, sitting beside them to hold them, uh, holding them, different textures, a secret code if they're old enough. You can have a secret code or, you know, wiggly ear, you know, something that they can do to tell you that they are dysregulated so that you are aware of that. Um, space, they might just need a little space. Um, touch. I saw this on a, um, a TBRI um, instructional video. We'll talk about TBRI in a minute. But um, something that you could do that's kind of fun, probably for a preschooler age, three to seven maybe even. Um, take one of those pool noodles, right? Cheap, get a pool noodle, get a couple of them or cut one in half. And if your child is bouncing off the walls, what they showed here was put on some kid happy music and just you as the adult, you're just hitting the noodle on the table. You're going like this and you're looking at the child and like, if they don't get the idea, you just kind of hold their hand and you're hitting the noodle together. You don't want to hit on the head, even though it doesn't hurt, that's, that doesn't go well. But you're just hitting, hitting, you know, just kind of getting that pulse going. And that pulse is like the heartbeat that just kind of calms them down and they can get to a more calm level. There's lots of things online if you want to Google this. There's lots of ideas. Um, it just takes that adult to meet the need. Even if the child can communicate the need, they may need your help getting regulated again. Helping that child's nervous system to find that calm and oriented state. It's different for each child and you know your child what might work. So kind of experiment. Ask the older child, how do I know when you're dysregulated? <laughs> what are, how would I know? And see if they can help you with that. And that helps them to know about themselves. I have a few nuggets from a book called The Body Keeps the Score. You might be familiar with that. Highly recommend it. Um, this is not a summary, but just a couple nuggets. Trauma affects how the children's immune system works and how their attention and concentration works. Wow, it affects so much, right? Trauma causes children to be out of sync. Participation, participation in team sports can help them to learn being in sync with others. That's great. They just learn that they just can't go off and 
be triggered on their own. They gotta keep the balls moving on the court. You know, they, they have to work together. Asking older kids their opinion and how they are feeling teaches them that they matter. I think this is really important. You know, did I need my six-year-old son's advice on something, what they thought, what I, th you know, he thought, no. But it teaches them that he's a person and he's unique. You know, these kids a lot of times are just minimized to, you know, black trash peg of their belongings or maybe just what they, the clothes they had on their back. And so for them to feel special, for them to know really intentionally that someone cares about what they're thinking makes a big difference. Let's see, how are we on time? So here's another strategy that you might find helpful just in dealing with behaviors, and this um, is used with permission from the Center for Resilient Children. It's, it's different than flipping it. Anybody heard of flipping, flipping your lid? The hand thing? Okay, that's on my handout, so that's something else we just don't have time for, but this is called FLIP, and it's just an acronym to help children who are um, dysregulated or you're dealing with specific behaviors. So the example I'm gonna use is let's say a little boy doesn't share with a girl. And she's mad, so she bites him. So that's what we're dealing with. We're talking with the girl in this example. So you start with the feelings. You say to the girl, I can see you're upset. You know, I'd be, I'd be mad too if somebody didn't share with me. You move on to limits where you're reminding and saying, you know what, we don't bite. That's not what we do. Whatever the boundaries are or the rules, you just remind them of that. Then you go on to the inquiries. This is, these are the questions that help them learn to problem solve, help them think, which is hard, especially when they're triggered. Saying things like, what can you do differently? What can I do to help? It goes from those questions and those answers to the prompts, which lead to the actions. Things like, we can take a walk, uh, we can chat, do you need a hug, things like that. So I really like this, it's concise. You can teach this to your older children to help them go through this themselves. So I'm gonna circle back a little bit. We're almost done here, we're gonna have a time of Q&A um, to talk a little bit about um, where our son David is. And like I said, he's given me permission to share this. Um, he had um, more behaviors in high school, which I'm not gonna share, That's, that part's his story. Very, very difficult years in high school. Um, it seemed like his fetal alcohol syndrome and the things involved in that didn't really come out until he had to do adulting on his own. And you may find that too, that things are more at a minimum in the home and they just might show up more when they're out of the home. We did find out also that in his case, he has um, a life-threatening blood clotting disorder. He had a, um, we found a blood clot to his lung is the first we found out about it when he was in his early 20s. And then in 2018, that was a very, very hard year for us. I'll never forget that year. Um, he has mental health issues and they were not diagnosed and it took a while, as you may can, can relate to, figuring out what it was and what kind of medication worked. And in that year, he was hospitalized six times for suicidal ideation and um, made two attempts. And of course, um, yeah, that was just hard. Um, you know, I went through a lot spiritually, just um, fearing that he would succeed and be able to take his life. And you know, I, I know God protects us, but just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean that wouldn't happen. Um, so that was a hard year. The good that came of that was that he does, I think he's in a good spot as far as his medications and everything. He's doing so much better than he was then. <laughs> um, so that I wanna give you hope for that, <laughs> for whatever you go through. <laughs> um, he's, because of his mental health issues and because he has to take medication, he has to give himself an injection of a blood thinner twice a day. The oral medicines don't work for him. And he's just not very responsible with doing that or doesn't want to. So he's um, in a, a group home for people with mental illnesses. Um, and they're, they make sure that he takes that. It helps me to sleep better at night. <laughs> um, he has a case manager that helps him deal with money, helps him be sure that rent's paid. That helps us, our relationship as well. And what's really nice now is that Lee and I can be just the support to him. He lives in town, like about 15 minutes from us. 
we see him every weekend, if not every other weekend. Um, you know, I take him to his doctor's appointments, things like that, and um, we have a great relationship now. It wasn't always that way. It was, it, even just six months ago, we had a big incident where it was pretty bad. But God's just working in miraculous ways. <laughs> Two weeks ago, um, a week and a half ago, he, had these, he has moments of clarity where he gets to thinking about things, especially spiritually. He's still on his spiritual journey. Um, and he called our oldest, Natalie. The girls are both disciples. He called Natalie and had a two-and-a-half-hour conversation with her about things he had felt guilty about, about things that happened in the teen ministry, about just a whole bunch of things came out. And then he called us and talked for an hour and a half that night. And so and what resulted from that was I want to come back to church and there's a couple people I want to talk to and apologize. And so he was at church that next Sunday. Yeah. And I mean, you know, we're not, we're not, we don't know where that's going, but amen. Yes. And so that's just a, hopefully in some encouragement about um, his story. There's some situations, you know, we've covered a lot, but, um, oh, I was going to say, I used to pray for all the kids when they were little, that they become disciples, don't we? I mean, that's what we pray, right? Um, and I still pray that for David. But now what's more of a gut prayer is that he would understand the depth of God's love and that see Jesus as the healer. That's my daily prayer. Because when he does, I think he will become a disciple. When he sees that and really understand that. Um, and, but I want to say with all this that we've covered, we're coming in for a landing here, there are some situations that simply require professional help. And there's a lot of resources out there. Um, TBRI stands for Trust-Based Relational Intervention. These are uh, things on the handout. Um, that's wonderful. And a, a book called The Connected Child by Dr. Karen Purvis goes with that. And specific ways of parenting for these kids with these behaviors. Brain mapping is another thing. Um, EMDR, eye movement and desensitization reprocessing. That's a mouthful. But that's where um, a specific type of counseling that helps um, lessen, it helps break those brain synapses of the trauma. It helps break them so that they don't automatically go from one to a thousand. Um, and also neurofeedback therapy is another one. These are just some of them. So please don't hesitate to get what your family needs, for sure. I'm gonna wrap up here with a couple questions for you to take away. What's the why behind my child's behavior? We talked about this. Please try to have that embedded in your mind when they're just flipping out, doing whatever, screaming, biting, saying cuss words at you. I've heard them all. Just to remember, um, there's a reason. There's something behind that, more than likely, with these kids. And secondly, what can I do to aid the healing process? We talked about that, that trust, the time, connection, um, and all the things that we talked about. And I'm going to end, we're going to have a time of Q&A, but I'm going to end this part uh, with a scripture from Psalm 10, 17 and 18 from the New Living Translation. Lord, you know the hopes of the helpless. Surely you will hear their cries and comfort them. You will bring justice to the orphans and to the oppressed, so mere people can no longer terrify them. Thank you. Okay, so for the Q&A, um, please remember that this is live streamed and recorded. So if you can keep your questions not so much family specific, but general, that would be great. Um, and I'm going to leave my number here on the screen too, because I'd be happy to talk with any of you later. And like I said, I'd love to have as many of you as possible on that virtual um, once a month support group. So we're going to have, take any questions? Okay, okay. And my husband's kind of fielding my phone with the ones that have come in from virtual. Can you use the microphone, please? Okay, here we go. If you could go back and change one thing in how you parented David, what would it be? Hmm. Probably what I shared is just to um, not react, to be more like that foster mom. Um, not react to, to things in the moment like I would with our biological kids because it's so different. And just to take the time and think about um, what could possibly be behind the behavior 
And also, I'd probably take a lot more time praying <laughs> in those moments. Or we have a uh, eight-year-old that's development, developmentally delayed, had some inappropriate behavior at school. Is it helpful for schools to know that he's adopted, and how do you communicate that? I personally think it's helpful for them to know. In fact, um, each time our son started a new school year, I would email the teacher and, and tell her, him or her, um, just a little bit about his, his background so she could have that little bit of extra compassion, hopefully. Um, you know, and now like this is said in the video, they're learning, the teachers are learning to be trauma informed so that they can, um, you know, respond a little bit differently. So I would answer that question, yes, and you can just be direct and, and tell the teachers. And a lot of times um, I, I just ask them to communicate with me if something comes up, if there's a behavior and I can, you know, help explain maybe what we do at home that helps with that behavior. So I think it is very helpful. What about if your adopted children are all grown up? How can we help them? Well, this, the same things like I was saying, you know, like for David, just helping him to know I'm always there and trying to get out of the uh, parent role and be more the friend and the coach, but not a parent. Um, sometimes what helps with us is letting things go. <laughs> Even as a teenager, it's hard to let the things like brushing teeth go. <laughs> But um, that's just us personally. You might not feel that way. But, um, you know, things like, you know, it's, there's enough other things. There's enough other heart issues and enough other things. And as adults, you know, we can, as they are adults, we can always be, hey, have you filled out those applications? Have you done, you know, and just be on them about this. Yes, they need to adult. Um, but I think what we've learned to do is ask what he needs help with. Like, he is learning disabilities, so he really can't fill out applications very well by himself, but instead of saying, hey, which I did wrong, you know, I did this the wrong way. I said, hey, we're gonna do five applications today. But instead, you know, say, hey, I'm available at one o'clock. Um, I'm, I'm here if you need help for those applications and sometimes letting the chips fall where they may and then sometimes they learn that way. Um, parents have experienced trauma growing up, I mean, themselves growing up. And we're expecting a baby soon. So are there things that we can be doing now to help our past not affect our newborn? That's a great question. And I'm glad this person is thinking about that. It's, it's the time to do it before you have children. Um, and just get, I would suggest just getting the professional help for that with a counselor to work through those things. Because if, if you haven't had children before, you'll know that it brings things out, <laughs> it tests you. And so what's underneath is gonna come out. And so I think even if you're thinking about adopting, I think it's really good um, to just, as much as you can, get counseling that you need for some of those issues. Uh, the last one from online was uh, the name of the Facebook Forever Families page. It's just called Forever Families um, and just Google it. And you'll see on there, if you scroll down, you'll see comments from me and uh, Vicki Burgum is another one who's instrumental, who actually put, made sure that we had these classes at the conference. <laughs> She's behind that. Um, so, or you can just text me if you can't find it. Okay. Any other, other questions? Are quest there questions here in the room? Back in the back. Uh, yeah, you mentioned getting him tested for like ADHD and uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. Do you have any resources for that? It seems like post pandemic it's getting harder and harder to find resources for adequate testing of childhood conditions. Uh, do you have any references for that or resources? It would be hard not knowing your state. I mean, every state um, has them. Um, probably could find those online. I'm sure there's a lot to sift through, but um, going to a doctor, you know, doctors have the, you know, the surveys that, that they determine if a child has ADHD. And um, I know that there was a place in Indianapolis near us that was kind of a molecular, I don't know what it was, a cellular, something that they did with the uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. So if you'd like to text me on that, I can take a look and, and let me know your state. I can help you find those if you'd like. 
Hi, Kathy. Um, we were we got here late, but I didn't know if you addressed this earlier. But um, how do you guys deal with discipline as far as spanking, or how does that work? That is a great question, probably the million dollar question. And the classes that follow, I'm assuming that they will um, address that. There's one on fostering and one on adoption. Um, I know for us, um, I think that is something we would have probably done differently if we were to go back. We you know, this is 25 years ago, right? <laughs> uh, we just thought, you know, you just spank. And um, we waited six months to spank David for the first time so that we could bond a little bit, but I don't know that we would have done as much spanking now with David, um, just because of, we don't know if he's seen domestic violence. Um, so that's a real personal decision, but um, it's a, one to think through and pray about more carefully with these kids from the trauma background. And there's some people who firmly believe, um, disciples who believe that if they come from that background that you should not spank them in that case. That spanking in general is biblical, but in that case, it's kind of like with that girl, you know, we just have to deal with them a little bit differently is my, my opinion. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, if you have kids that are teenagers under 18, um, starting to have some risky behaviors, how do you strike a balance between showing them that you really do care, but really cannot accept you know, their behaviors? That's a good question, too. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I should be repeating the question. So if you have teenagers in the home that are exhibiting risky behavior, how do you show that you care but yet deal with the behavior? Um, behavior needs to be dealt with. It'll just get worse, um, most likely. But I think just talking with them and assuring them that you love them and that we really need to get help together. That's some, something, depending on the behavior, if it's sexual behaviors, yes, I think you need to get help if it's especially sexual behaviors. Um, and that's stemming from a lot of different things. But um, I think that there's ways you can do that just with the time spent, like I was talking about, just to show them your love for them, but that this is a serious issue and, and you don't want them to feel like they're a bad kid. It's not that they're a bad kid. It's the same idea as, you know, hate the sin, love the sinner. We want them to know that they're not a bad apple, <laughs> they're not a bad kid, but they're going through things. And it could be because of their past, they're old enough to know that, and that you just wanna help them to, to make different and better choices. Yeah, uh, yeah um, I was wondering if you could maybe share something about how you, your husband, or maybe even your daughter self, dealt with the secondary trauma. Um, you maybe heard that, but how did we deal with the secondary trauma? Um, like I said, we, this is really new. We, we didn't. We, we didn't do a good job dealing with the secondary trauma. Um, what we would have done better, I think, is just have those times with our daughters and talk with them about things. One thing I think it's really important to say to the siblings is that you can tell mom and dad anything is a safe place. You can tell us anything because they might be afraid. Like, who knows, the, the sibling could be hurting them or something and they're afraid to say something. So just being sure that they have a safe place. And I think that self-care for the, the parents, just having a break, you just, we need breaks. We can't be dealing with these things 24 seven. We just need breaks. Anything else over here? Oh. Um, so my question is similar about sibling relationships, and I think our concerns are, so our seven-year-old who was adopted has just more negative behaviors and so is in trouble more at school and at home, and so how to um, not allow him to feel, you know, as though something is wrong, that his, you know, he has these more behaviors. But then at the same time, if we are parenting in a different way, we have an eight-year-old, um, and often... Um, if they do the same exact thing, there may be different consequences mm -hmm. uh, for the two. And so how to address, you know, just the issues of fairness among the siblings. That's a great question. That's a hard one. Um, things might not always be fair. And the older they are, you can explain it at least to the siblings. Um, what we did in a couple of cases is we had to have some 
rules in place that were for David, but to make it fair, we held the girls to it too. And we had told them about it ahead of time. We said, we're gonna say, you know, this is what, what we, if you don't do this, then this is a consequence. We know that you guys really don't need it. <laughs> really, it's just David that needs it, but let's just all get together. And it was good for us to go back when we explained it to David and said, this is the rule for the household. Your sisters have to do this too. And we tried to explain that, that he needs that. He needs that boundary, he needs that. So we're just gonna do it for everybody. But I don't think it always has to be the same. Yeah. Uh, oh, Kathy, mm -hmm. um, thank you, by the way, this is amazing. So uh, my wife and I became foster parents uh, after we became empty nesters. And we sought a bunch of advice because we're in the ministry. And so, but we were given advice on both sides. Some thought, nah, you shouldn't do it. And then other people said, yes. Now we went ahead and did it, obviously. Uh, one of the best things we've ever done. Um, and one of the children is still in our family. So, but what would you tell people, you know, if they're getting, you know, uh, advice that doesn't, you know, advice maybe on both sides or maybe an advice not to? That's a great question, too. It's not for everybody. It is not for everybody. Even though the scripture in James 1, 27 says to look after orphans, there's other ways to do that. Um, I would say your best advice is going to be from foster parents who've done it. And that's the advice I would weigh more heavily is from a foster parent who's done it. And you've got to look at other things in your life. Like if someone's struggling with anxiety or depression, maybe not the best idea for that, those parents. I don't know. I mean, it's, it, is, it is a lot. So that's what I would just say is the way the advice more heavily that comes from people who have walked in those shoes to decide and to know that you don't have to feel guilty to say no. <laughs> if, you know, if you say no, there's other ways you can support. In fact, um, on the handout is information about an organization called Care Portal. It's becoming spreading in the United States. Uh, it's in different states. And our church grabbed onto it. It uses churches to help meet the needs of foster children and vulnerable children. And we work actually side by side with our local Hope Worldwide chapter to do that. So I can tell you about that if anyone's interested in that. But yeah, it's, it's hard when you get the differing advice, for sure. Um, I had a question about celebrating their adoption in the family and also telling the details of their life before they came into their home, how to do that, at what age, and the sensitivity of it, if it's not such a positive thing that you wanna protect them from? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, if you wanna text me your information, I did a whole a class on that about when to tell your children or anybody, I, I can send that to you. It's, it's more than just a brief answer. Um, and it's, this is just advice, it's not, you know, not black and white, but um, I feel that their information about their adoption and their history should be known and told to them by the time they're 12, if not before. I mean, they should know that they're adopted from day one, as my feeling. But when they're getting to their teenage years, those hormones kick in and it could be all over the place and they could be really upset if they find out later that you held something back and they're adult enough, I feel like, at that age to know and I'm sorry, what was the first part of your question? That was the second part. How to celebrate the adoption in the family. Celebrate, and that's just really personal. Um, you know, some, I think it's great to celebrate it. And you know, even if, if you know of other adoptive families to include in that celebration because they get it. You know, having the gotcha day and, and that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Can you speak on your um, adoption coaching, what that looks like? Yes, that's a good question. I get that a lot. What is adoption coaching? <laughs> it's different than counseling, and I help both post and pre-adoption, more post than pre. And it's just going alongside with you in your journey, and it's usually about a specific situation that families need help with to get through. It, it's counseling is more about the mental health diagnoses, which is not what I do, and it's more a situation like um, you know how to deal with this interaction with the birth parent situation, or you know. We're considering residency for our child. You know, talk us through. They help us with that, and I can give valuable resources too for other things. So, that's what it is. It's just someone who's in your court, <laughs> coaching you. I think of a sports coach. <laughs> 
you know, that, you know, people know the people on the team know how to play football, but they just need direction and um, someone just to just give them that halftime, you know, speech that, hey, you're going to make it and just be the support. So that's what I do. Maybe one more question. Okay. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, I guess Lee's going to answer one or ask one. If you could, the microphone, please, Mike, uh, John. Yep. Okay, so he said, um, how to handle lying. Well, we don't have time for that, but <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it's, always, it's always good to ask a lot of questions, like things, were you afraid that you were going to get punished? Were you, were you, is that why you lie? You know, just kind of ask a lot, a lot of questions. And I would say giving more grace than you would probably your biological children. Obviously, it's not acceptable. <laughs> it's not acceptable to God. Um, but we do need to be a little bit more, my opinion, less heavy-handed as we walk with them. So it's a journey. So that the lying is a journey thing. Um, yeah. So thank you. I'm sorry we're out of time. Enjoy the classes that are coming. Thank you. Thank you.